doesn't work. Interesting. Um, I'll try using Chrome. Okay. Or maybe um, I can message John. Yeah, that also works. Oh, wait, does it work? Okay, yeah, I think it works now. Okay. Yeah, sorry for this weird starting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, no problem. But you, you didn't click that button that you mentioned, right? Yeah, so it just guys, started so automatically. I, maybe. So I clicked on it like several times, but <laughs> okay. it was not just given any response, you know? <laughs> okay. Okay, anyway. So uh, welcome everybody to the second meeting of this PNS SoftMC course. Um, so first, thanks. Uh, so I would like to thank our students for submitting homework zero, uh, which I think I forgot uh, to mention that it was required. Uh, but like, yeah, it is like quite low overhead thing. And yeah, thanks for submitting it. Um, so what we will do today. So first we will uh, look at this uh, work um, so you, uh, that you can see on this slide. Uh, so Gerai will um, tell us about like this recent study that um, uh, all, um, like you can see the authors from like our research group did. Um, and yeah, he will like um, talk, uh, like give some details about the Rohammer problem and like explain what we did in this work. So in the second part of the meeting, uh, we will go over the um, uh, projects, right? So we will have 11 different projects to um, uh, offer you and then you will uh, choose um, those that you would prefer working on. Uh, so at 1 p.m. today, so it will be two hours after, yeah, so, so we expect this meeting to last uh, at most for two hours. So at uh, 1 p.m., uh, the um, projects will, uh, like project preferences will be um, online on Moodle, and then you will be able to submit your preferences uh, from that time until uh, Sunday, uh, Sunday midnight. Okay, so like you'll have roughly five days. Um, okay, and one last thing, I encourage you to ask questions, make sure that you understand as much as you can from this talk, because like that you will be relevant. So, so it will be relevant for all of the projects that you will be working on, like no, no matter which, which project you choose, but it will be especially relevant uh, for those that will, uh, that will pick projects related to Rohammer. Okay, and I guess like this is all I wanted to say. Uh, if you have any questions so far like related to the logistics of this course, I can take those. Otherwise we will start with the presentation. I have one question from my side. Okay. So um, we uh, ch really choose from that set of 11 projects and we, but can we like maybe adjust them slightly tailored to like our own ideas or come up with own project ideas too? or? Is it really just one of those 11 projects that we choose from? Um, yeah, so like if you have like your own ideas, uh, you can discuss those too, right? So like, uh, I guess we are definitely not limited to like these 11 mm -hmm. projects, but like that never happened in the past that somebody like proposed a project. But yeah, if, if you have ideas, uh, we can discuss those and maybe like you can mm -hmm. work on your own project. And as I explained last time, so like uh, the, um, we will give you like very brief descriptions of these projects, right? And and the goals will not be like very well defined. So like you always have the um, um, uh, like uh, option to yeah. in, uh, to extend these ideas, right? To like okay. uh, in, include your own things like in those directions that we will mm -hmm. uh, provide you. Okay, cool, thanks. Yeah. Um, great, then. Yeah, we can, we can start with the presentation then. Okay, thanks, Hassan. So welcome everyone. Uh, today we will talk about this paper as Hassan mentioned. The paper's name is Revisit and Rohammer, an experimental analysis of modern devices and mitigation techniques. Um, I'm assuming that you, you're some, somewhat familiar with Rohammer, but uh, there will be some background coming in, in a few slides. So don't worry about it if you're not that familiar. And um, I'm Girai, I'm the third daughter here. Uh, Jeremy and Minesh are alumni now. So uh, yeah, uh, 
we will talk about this. Uh, as Hassan said, feel free to ask questions and make sure that you understand. Um, so uh, it's it's very relevant because this paper is using the uh, soft MC infrastructure that uh, you will be using in this PNS course. Okay. So uh, I'll start with an executive summary. Uh, so the motivation of this work is that um, we suspect that Dancer DRAM chips are more vulnerable to draw hammer, uh, but uh, there is no characterization based study that actually demonstrates how exactly the vulnerability scales across different DRAM generations. And the problem is the, that um, uh, it's unclear whether current mitigation mechanisms uh, will remain uh, viable for future DRAM chips, uh, uh, which, which will be probably more vulnerable to draw hammer. So this, this work is uh, actually trying to understand uh, in terms of like DRAM technology and raw hammer, where we stand today. By today, I mean like 2020, because this paper is like around two years old now, uh, but it's still relevant. So the first goal of this project is to experimentally demonstrate how vulnerable modern DRAM chips are to raw hammer and uh, study how this vulnerability will scale going forward. And the second thing is to study the viability of existing mitigation mechanisms on more vulnerable chips. So this is the first experimental study that rigorously characterizes raw hammer across a broad range of DRAM chips. And this work, uh, we uh, characterize uh, uh, 1,580 chips uh, from different DRAM types, technology generations and manufacturers. And we find that raw hammer vulnerability worsens in newer chips. So we experimentally demonstrate that here. And uh, as a next step, uh, we also look at the raw hammer mitigation mechanisms of that time. And we study how uh, five state-of-the-art raw hammer mitigation mechanisms uh, can um, scale with this uh, uh, in increase in raw hammer vulnerability. And we show that uh, there's a reasonable performance loss around like 8% on average on modern DRAM chips uh, when we scale the uh, state-of-the-art raw hammer mitigation mechanism. And uh, we show that uh, the scaling is, uh, uh, is poor to more vulnerable DRAM chips. And uh, the performance loss can reach up to like 80%, for example, which is like very drastic. And uh, we conclude that uh, it's, critical, uh, it's critical to research more effective solutions for raw hammers uh, for future DRAM chips. Uh, that will likely be uh, even more vulnerable to raw hammer. Okay, this is the outline. And I'll start with a brief raw hammer introduction and DRAM background. And then we will uh, move into the experiments and the results. So when we talk about raw hammer, uh, we need to actually think about the DRAM as like a uh, first talk about DRAM structure, right? So in, the, in a DRAM chip, we have these structures or uh, components called like rows, and uh, you access uh, data in a row granularity internally. So uh, when we want to access data uh, from a row, say uh, row two in this case, you need to first open this row two and then uh, read the uh, data or write into the row two. And then when you're done with that, to be able to access another row, you need to close this row and then open another row. So this is a um, regular uh, DRAM operation, how you access data in DRAM chips. And uh, when you do this thing like uh, back and forth, uh, a lot of times uh, you can induce some bit fillips in, in rows adjacent to row two, like row one and row three, for example, in this case. And if you keep doing this even more, then you can induce even more bit flips in like, not only in adjacent rows, but some nearby rows as well. And this whole thing is called row hammer. So you hammer row two, and then you induce bit flips around it. And uh, here in this, uh, uh, in, the, in this uh, terminology, we call this row two, the, the row that we hammer as aggressor row, and the other rows that uh, uh, experience bit flips as victim rows. Okay, a little bit DRAM background. Uh, 
So within each row, we have a lot of uh, DRAM cells, each of which contains one bit of data. And uh, this data is stored as charge in, in some leaky capacitors. Uh, and the circuitry is something like this within a cell. So you have a word line, a bit line, and uh, a capacitor and an access transistor. So the, uh, so the voltage on this capacitor or the charge stored in this capacitor indicates uh, this bit is one or zero. And you access uh, this charge through the bit line, uh, through access transistor. And to open and close the access transistor, you actually write this word line. And uh, there are several charge leakage paths here. And uh, stored data is corrupted if too much charge leaks uh, before we uh, access the uh, charge in the capacitor. And this is a uh, this is a example example of uh, how capacitor voltage changes over time. So you see that there is an exponential decay here. And there's a V min voltage that we can lose some charge. That's okay until we reach this like V min voltage uh, where we can still um, read the data reliably. And uh, yeah, above this V min level, uh, we can read the data. But if it goes below this V min level, then uh, we can uh, observe bit flips. So to avoid that in regular D operation, there's an operation called refresh that we periodically refresh these DRAM cells to preserve the stored data. And this refresh operation is uh, done periodically at some constant uh, uh, time interval. And uh, we call that time interval refresh window here. So what happens when we do raw hammer? So the cell leaks charge, and then we hammer a row nearby that. And then the uh, leakage is exacerbated here. And then it keeps leaking more. And then you do raw hammer again. And then it, it, it's exacerbated again. And then at the end, you induce some raw hammer bit flip without the cell is refreshed in its current like uh, uh, constant refresh window. And by doing so, uh, a lot of papers. One question. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, sure. Um, I just wanted to ask. Uh... Uh, in this uh, scenario, on each of the roll hammer attacks, is always like a bit. Uh, is, uh, does always a bit flip occur when there's like this capacitor voltage drop, or um, is this in this demonstration, in this example, theoretical example, only on the second one? So, I mean, what I'm interested in is like, does this capacitor voltage drop always occur only when a bit flip happens, or can a bit flip also? Um, Happen like it, does this capacitor voltage drop also happen if no bit flip occurs on nearby cells? So yeah, voltage drop occurs like this, right? If there is no attack, um, but I mean, there is no bit flip in this case. And uh, here, uh, so with this drop, you don't observe any bit flip. You are still above V min, right? But with the second one, uh, well, actually, at this point, you don't observe bit flip. But since the leakage continues, even if you don't do attack, uh, you get very close to V-min. And then at some point it goes below V-min. And then at this point, you there, there's a high chance that you can experience a bit flip. Okay. So this is more like a cartoonish, right? It doesn't yeah, yeah. exactly happen yeah. like this. Yeah. yeah. So, but this we're looking at kind of a, the capacitor theoretical or model capacitor voltage of a nearby cell. So not the cell that's being accessed, right? This is like a yes. neighboring cell. Okay. Yeah, because every time you access a cell, actually you do charge restoration, which is equivalent to refreshing the charge over there. So okay. this is this this is happening to other rows around it. Yes. Okay. I see. Thank you. And and that's why actually it's uh so it's it's something extra dangerous because uh, you're accessing a row and then you're inducing bit flip in a different row. And if you think about it, actually, um, so you have like multiple applications running on a system, right? And you allocate some memory space for each of the applications. And uh, an application just hammers its own address space. And then it happens to be like there's another application, maybe some routine from the operating system, some critical data stored in a like nearby role in the DRAM. And you induce pit flips over there. And, that application doesn't have any idea about like what is going on. 
but there's a bit of it. And then that's how uh, actually um, people use this kind of vulnerability to, they exploit this vulnerability to like take over systems, you know, steal some private keys, uh, I don't know, change some critical applications behaviors, all those kind of things. Yeah, okay. So there's another question here. Is BitPhillip only over from high to low voltage? Or are low to high BitPhillips also possible? So in theory, it's also possible. Yeah, actually there, there is some work showing that as well, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah, on top of my head, I don't have like a very uh, detailed answer for this question, but yes, it's also possible. Um, because uh, the way you sense the, uh, bit line voltage, um, so maybe I can go back a little bit. So when you access the capacitor charge here, uh, so you enable this access transistor and the charge is shared with the bit line. And bit line has a very high impedance uh, compared to capacitor um, and they ch share their charge. Um, so bit line is initially charged to, uh, a voltage between the high voltage and low voltage. So if high voltage is VDD uh, bit line is, and the low voltage is ground, a uh, bit line is uh, charged, pre-charged to VDD over two. And uh, if you have like VDD here, uh, when you share it, uh, the bit line voltage goes slightly above VDD over two, like we call it VDD over two plus Delta. And if this is ground, uh, like there's no charge in the capacitor, which is like programmed to low charge. And then this goes to like VDD over two minus Delta, right? And um, this there is a sense amplification circuitry connected to this bit line. And it uh, compares uh, the voltage deviation in this bit line uh, to VDD over two. And uh, if you lose charge uh, in a like, um, program to high charge voltage, um, you can get like very, uh, a voltage level very close to VDD over two, right? Uh, but this charge charge leakage paths can uh, can work in the opposite direction if the capacitor charge is programmed to like low low charge, and then uh, in that case maybe you will not have ground here, but due to this charge leakage, you will have like ground plus some delta. And then it will uh, again make the bit line voltage after the charge sharing closer to VDD over two. And then it can cause some bit fillip as well. Um, but I think in the literature, we observe more bit fillips from like high voltage to low voltage. Uh, that can be another thing to look at actually. Okay. Um, how many open and closed operations can you do between each uh, refresher window? You mean like a ther theoretical maximum that we can perform or uh, to induce raw hammer bit flips? Like, like, um, like the refresh window is usually like 64 milliseconds, right? That was from the last, yes. last lecture. And um, how many operations can you fit in for, for the opening and closing operations then during the 64 milliseconds? Yeah. So uh, according to like uh, the, the specifications of DRAM protocols, uh, there is a minimum time interval that you can uh, put uh, between two activations targeted in the same bank, which is like uh, this set of rows basically. And it is around like 15 nanoseconds, like 46 nanoseconds, something like that. And um, if you keep uh, doing like back-to-back -back row activations, that's how you do row hammer. Uh, in theory, you can reach up to like around 1.4 million, I guess. Uh, I don't remember the exact number, but you can just divide like 64 millisecond to like 46 nanoseconds, something like that. And uh, you can have that many uh, hammers in theory. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there any other questions or? Okay, yeah, feel free to interrupt me. Okay. Uh... 
here. What was I talking about? Okay, so um, there is another thing to mention here. Uh, there is uh, some variation due to the imperfection in the manufacturing process in DRAM chips. And based on that, uh, you have some cells, <coughs> excuse me, with low retention time and high retention time. And some cells are more vulnerable to row hammer and some cells are not so vulnerable to row hammer. So there's some variation across cells as well. And uh, you see that like when you do the raw hammer, some cells can uh, observe like less exacerbated charge leakage. And if you look at the screen curve, for example, it is successfully refreshed before going below beam in here. And you don't observe any bit flip here. But uh, for this blue one, for example, it was very close, but yeah, there's still a high chance you can uh, experience, observe a bit flip. Okay. Uh, so let's move to the motivation and goal if the background is clear. So <clears throat> the motivation of the study is that um, we know that then we suspect that or dancer DRAM chips are more vulnerable to raw hammer. And uh, there are like three prior works uh, before this work uh, over the last six years uh, that provide raw hammer characterization data on real DRAM. However, uh, there is no comprehensive experimental study that demonstrates how vulnerable to scales across uh, different DRAM types and technology not generations. And it is unclear whether current mitigation mechanisms will remain viable for future DRAM chips that are likely to be more vulnerable to raw hammer. And the goal in this work is to experimentally demonstrate how vulnerable modern DRAM chips are to raw hammer and predict how this vulnerability will scale going forward and examine the viability of current mitigation mechanisms uh, on more vulnerable DRAM chips. Okay, so we can move into experimental methodology and talk about the results. Um, so, okay, I, I just need to move some things around. <laughs> okay, so this is our DRAM testing infrastructure. Uh, this is a modified version of SoftMC. And um, uh, this is very similar to what you will use. Uh, there are slight differences, but they're not important at the moment. Uh, actually, in this work, to be able to uh, look at this raw hammer vulnerability across DRAM generations, uh, we uh, use like different uh, source of infrastructure because an infrastructure supports only like one type of DRAM chips. And um, so we have these like DRAM protocols that you see in the market when you buy from computers and stuff. Like there's DDR3, DDR4, LPDDR4. These are like the uh, newest ones of the time. Now there's DDR5 coming, but uh, it's it's not really on the market dominating DDR4 yet. Um, so for DDR3, we use a FPGA-based system that is programmed with SoftMC uh, using Xilinx ML605 FPGA board. Uh, this is the SoftMC version that, that has been public on GitHub. And uh, we also use a DDR4 version of this. This is a highly modified version. Uh, and this one uses Xilinx Vertex Ultra Scale 95. And uh, we also have some Alveo boards. I guess you will use those boards. And um, okay, a, a third one is LPDDR4, uh, which is an in house testing hardware for LPDDR4 chips. Uh, so you will not have access to this one. Uh, but it's not important because we see similar trends uh, everywhere. So, um, okay, so all these infrastructures provide fine grained control over DRAM commands, timing parameters, and temperature. And uh, if you remember from previous lectures, uh, the whole purpose of SoftMC is actually to um, give this uh, fine grained control on DRAM commands and timing parameters uh, for you, right? And we also connect the temperature controller in this one, uh, which has some rubber heater and thermocouple around the dim. So this part, uh, so you don't see the DRAM chips here because they're uh, sandwiched in between two rubber heaters and uh, uh, put, put together with a clamp. And there's a thermocouple based temperature sensor. So there is a closed uh, loop uh, control here that's going on like this temperature controller is constantly measuring the thermal uh, temperature on DRAM chips using this thermocouple. 
and it heats up the rubber heaters if the temperature goes low. So it keeps the temperature stable at a desired level uh, uh, with, with a, a, a precision of like 0 0.1 Celsius degree. Okay, so uh, in this study, we uh, test a lot of DRAM chips from uh, DDR3, DDR4, and LPDDR4. So we classify them as like old, new for DDR3 and DDR4. And for LPDDR4, we have the we have the technology node names. Uh, we have like one X and one Y. Uh, and these are the number of chips for each of them. And you can see uh, more details about this in the paper. So in total, we have 1,580 total DRAM chips uh, tested from 300 DRAM modules. And uh, we test uh, chips from three major DRAM manufacturers. And these DRAM types, uh, uh, yeah, okay, yeah. I already talked about this. And um, yeah, so we have two technology nodes per DRAM type. And um, okay, yeah, this is how we name them. Uh, okay, so uh, to characterize our DRAM chips at worst case conditions, uh, we follow uh, a two step approach. The first one is to prevent sources of interference during core test loop. So uh, we want to make sure that any bit flip that we observe is due to a raw hammer attack, for, but not for any other uh, vulnerability or failures. So to ensure that we disable the DRAM refresh to avoid refreshing victim row uh, during an attack, and we disable DRAM calibration events to minimize the variation in test timing so that we can precisely time every single row activation. And um, we disable all the row hammer mitigation mechanisms to observe the circuit level effects. Uh, otherwise, uh, these mitigation mechanisms correct some bit flips or cause some other bit flips. Let's say you have an ECC and it uh, does the correction in a wrong way. You see bit flips in some other locations that were not existent actually in the real hardware. So we disable all those things so that uh, we, we, we can observe exactly the bit flip locations. And uh, we keep our tests for less than a refresh window. So it's written 32 millisecond here. Uh, because in LPDDR4 refresh window is started two milliseconds instead of 64 milliseconds. So uh, we keep everything smaller than 32 milliseconds. So uh, back to the previous calculation, I think in this case, uh, theoretical maximum of uh, row, uh, row opening and closing activations and precharge that we can perform it in a refresh window becomes something like 700,000, something like that. But we don't reach. We don't need to reach uh, that high values actually to uh, experience a bit flip. So uh, we uh, attack our DRAM chips uh, with the worst case access sequence based on the prior work. Um, so uh, it is uh, basically repeatedly accessing the two directly physically adjacent rows as fast as possible, which is called double sided throw hammer. And you can see more details in the paper or you can ask questions if you have any, and I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, okay, meanwhile, I'll keep moving. Uh, so this is our testing methodology. This is the, our core loop of test, actually. I'm just gonna briefly uh, walk over it. So uh, to start a test, we first initialize the victim row with some data pattern. And we also initialize, um, uh, the two aggressor rows uh, here and here, like two adjacent of the victim row. And then we disable the DRAM refresh uh, to prevent all those interferences. And uh, we refresh the victim row before starting the experiment so that we make sure that uh, all the charges are, all the cells are refreshed and uh, their charge levels are at the like uh, highest level, the, the farthest level from like, video or two. So they, they're like as uh, reliable as possible when I start the test. Okay, so uh, then what we do is we open one of the aggressor rows, like let's say this one, and then, uh, yeah, first close this for sure, and then open this. 
And we repeat this like many times. Uh, we alternatively uh, open and, okay, what happened to this? Okay, we, we open one aggressor row, close another one, and then we sw switch and then go back and forth like this for the number of hammer counts that we want. So we test these DRAM chips for like a very large number of hammer counts for like different types. Like um, for every hammer count that we test, we need to uh, uh, enable the DRAM refresh afterwards. And then uh, uh, th this makes sure that uh, we will not uh, experience any bit fillips or observe any bit fillips due to uh, retention time errors, for example, um, while we are reading back the data from victim row. And uh, we record all the bit fillips uh, in, the, in our uh, host machine's storage. And then we restore the bit fillips to the original values in, in all these three rows. And then we test another hammer count or another set of aggressor and victim rows. So we do this, for example, let's say for a hammer count of 20,000. And then we see uh, no bit fillip, let's say. And then uh, we increase the hammer count to 30,000, let's say. And then we try it again. And then uh, let's say we see bit fillips and then we reduce the hammer count and then try it again. So it's like a lot of iterative process. And then after we uh, we are done with the set of uh, aggressor and victim rows, uh, we uh, move our aggressor and victim assignments to a different set of rows, and then another set of rows, and then another set of rows. And this way we test a lot of DRAM rows. Okay, so this is how we do the experiments. And I'll share some characterization results, but before going there, do you have any questions about the testing methodology? I think if you're going to do anything related to a hammer, you will need to run some test routines similar to this. And you need to you know, um, design them wisely so that uh, they will not take too much time. And uh, at the same time, you will actually be testing like many aspects of this raw hammer vulnerability, for example. Not only for raw hammer, actually, if you want to characterize the retention errors, again, you need to follow a similar methodology to you know, precisely identify where the bit flip occurred, at, at what retention time it occurred, those kind of things. Maybe, uh, I don't know, this was probably said uh, before, but I just wanted to ask what exactly are retention errors again, and the difference to row hammer errors? Oh, uh, sure. Uh, let me go back to background. It's a, maybe I didn't uh, name it correctly when describing this. So due to this charge leakage, if you don't refresh at this point, it goes below Vmin, and then uh, you have an error, bit flip. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is called retention error because mm -hmm. the cell cannot retain data. Uh -huh. And and the the row hammer error is if this kind of uh, retention error is caused by a row hammer action. So uh, with retention error, you don't have row hammer here. Okay. So uh, the, but the... Uh, when you do row hammer, it exacerbates yeah. the retention, right? And mm -hmm. then uh, you have some row hammer bit flips here. If I might just add a second question, if, if we go below Vmin and then a refresh operation occurs, would the refresh then cause the capacitor voltage to drop to zero because it's below Vmin? Uh, so below Vmin, uh, it is, like so you cannot it? know basically. So it, it can boost up to VDD or yeah. uh, go down to ground as well. Mm. Um, so that's why I'm not saying that you will definitely have a bit fill up here. Okay. It's it's like there's a high chance you can have a bit fill up because it's mm. it's some undefined behavior. So okay. it, it shouldn't go below that voltage. Yeah, it's unreliable at this point. And mm. based on the circuit's physical characteristics, you can uh, observe different behaviors. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Okay. Okay. So, uh, oh, we already we are already done with the experimental methodology. Let's go to characterization results. Okay. So here are the key takeaways from our characterization or like uh, this many chips. 
Um, so first thing is, uh, chips of newer DRAM technology nodes are more vulnerable to row hammers. So, okay, there's someone in the waiting room. I added to this. So, uh, yeah, okay. Hello, welcome. <laughs> okay, so chips of newer DRAM chip technology nodes, uh, DRAM technology nodes are more vulnerable to row hammers. This is first. And then second is, there are chips today whose weakest cells fail after only like 4,800 hammers. And this is a ridiculously low number if you compare it to the maximum number of hammer you can reach in the refresh window, which is like 700,000 something for 32 milliseconds, 1.4 million for 64 milliseconds. And uh, chips of newer DRAM technology nodes can exhibit row hammer bit flips in more rows and farther away from the victim row. And we will actually talk about this in detail in a bit. Uh, basically, what it means is uh, now you hammer a row and you're experience, observing bit flips in the physically adjusted two rows, right? But now you can uh, observe like in, in farther rows, farther away rows as well, uh, like, like two row distance, three row distance, something like that. Okay, so let's first look at row hammer vulnerability. The question is, can we induce row hammer bit flips in all of our DRAM chips? And the answer is, all chips are vulnerable except many DDR3 chips, which is the oldest ones. And a total of uh, 1320 out of all like 1580 chips are vulnerable. So we can induce bit flips in this like 1300 chips out of 1580, which is uh, like 84% of our tested DRAM chips. And within the DDR3 old chips, only 12% of the chips are vulnerable. So it means that if you want to be safe from raw hammer, you can go to older generations. You can keep using DDR3's oldest chips. And then it's, it's okay, you can just uh, continue your life without worrying about raw hammer. But it's, it's very old and the, those don't have like very high density, high capacity. So those are not, even supported in like commodity, uh, many commodity systems today. They, they all come from with like DDR4, LPDDR4, and maybe like DDR5 chips uh, in, in the like nowadays or near future. And within DDR3 new chips, 65% uh, of the chips are still vulnerable. So it doesn't save you if you go for DDR3, you need to go, go with DDR3 old chips. And if you go for like newer versions of DDR3 chips, still uh, you have a lot of vulnerable chips. And the takeaway is newer DRAM chips are more vulnerable to raw hammer. So the second question is uh, about data pattern dependence. Uh, are some data patterns more effective in inducing raw hammer bit flips? And uh, so this is a tough question actually, but we have some data uh, about to, to give some idea. Uh, so we test several data patterns typically examined in prior work uh, to identify the worst data pattern. Um, so for sure, we don't uh, test like every possible single data pattern because it's like a lot of combinations and it takes years and years to be able to test everything. So we need to choose some of them, but we choose them based on what prior work observes. And the worst case, uh, we, we observed that the worst is data pattern among these several different data patterns is consistent across chips of the same manufacturer and DRAM type node configuration. So it's something relevant to the you know design and the manufacturing process, uh, like unique to a DRAM uh, manufacturer vendor. So we use the worst is data pattern for DRAM chip to characterize each chip uh, at worst is conditions and minimize the extensive testing time. Uh, uh, by doing so. And there are more details and figures in the paper that we are not going to get into because we have more interesting results coming. So, okay. Um, so in this uh, study, we look at like how the number of hammers or hammer counts affects uh, the number of bit flips induced. So uh, here's a, uh, here's a, uh, representative, uh, what's that, plot from uh, manufacturer A 
uh, for DDR4 new chips. And here uh, we increase our hammer count starting from 10,000. So if you look at this like logarithmic scale, right? Then you have like uh, 100,000 here. And uh, on the y-axis, you see the number of bit flips or bit flip rate in a row, actually. And you can see that uh, there is a clear increase in pattern. So, uh, so yeah. Uh, okay, so this is a not very so, so important detail, but okay, we need to mention that. So hammer count equals to like two axes, each hammer count. So when we say like 10,000 uh, as the hammer count here, it means like uh, 10,000 activations to one row and then another 10,000 activations to another row. So in, to in total, we do like 20,000 row activations to get this number of bit flips. Okay, so we look at the same thing across uh, different manufacturers and different uh, uh, DRAM types. Uh, so you can see like all of them are showing an increase in uh, pattern in their uh, bit flip rate. And uh, our conclusion is that row hammer bit flip rates increase when going from old to new DDR4 technology not generations and with larger hammer counts. Yeah. Okay, so you can see that DDR4 old is showing a curve below DDR4 new, right? So it's it's clearly getting worse and worse. And if you look at this red one, it's one of these LP DDR4s. Okay, so we also look at the uh, location of these bit flips, uh, and the question is where the raw hammer bit flips are here relative to the aggressor row. And to show that, we uh, plot the Excuse me. We plot a, a histogram basically. Uh, so on the y-axis, you see the fraction of row hammer bit flips with distance from the victim row, and uh, on the x-axis we have a relative distance to the victim row. So uh, if you remember, we have two aggressor rows sandwiching a victim row, and that victim row's address is zero, the relative address, um, and. Uh, these like minus one and plus one are the uh, two aggressor rows that we hammer. And uh, in these bars, you see the um, uh, fraction of raw hammer bit flips uh, with this distance. And uh, we observe that the number of raw hammer bit flips that occur in a given row decreases as this from the victim row increases. And uh, this, this actually makes sense, right? So you sandwich this victim row here and then uh, hammering each of these aggressor rows uh, induces an effect on the uh, victim, actual victim row at uh, the location zero. But if you look at the location two and minus two, like only one of these aggressor rows is adjacent to that, but the other one is a bit farther away. So it may or may not have some impact, but it's, it's not like as strong as like being the adjacent row. Okay, uh, so we normalize data by inducing bit flips of like uh, uh, bit flip rates of like uh, one in a million in each chip, and then uh, compare these results across uh, different uh, DRAM types here. So if you look at uh, DDR4 old, uh, you see bit flips only in the uh, victim row, and then if you look at DDR4 new, you can see some bit flips like popping up. Um, in the in the plus two minus two locations, and when you go to LPDDR for one Y, which is newer than DDR for Neo, then you start seeing like more bit flips uh, in like minus two plus two minus four plus four minus six and maybe plus six and some others. I don't know. So this tells us that the chips of newer DRAM technology nodes can exhibit raw hammer bit flips in more rows. And uh, these rows can be farther away from the victim row. Okay, uh, so we plot the data for each DRAM type node uh, uh, and for each manufacturer. So you have some subplots here with like uh, not enough data or no chips from this class, 
but yeah, you can see that this general trend uh, holds for like uh, pretty much all of them, right? So if you look at manufacturer B, for example, again, until LPDDR4, you don't see like many bit flips uh, in rows other than the victim row, but you start seeing uh, bit flips in like some other rows when you go to LPDDR4, for example. So uh, based on these, we, we, can, uh, we can say that it's getting, uh, the, the impact is getting wider, especially, right? Okay. <clears throat> also, we'll cut how our row hammer bit flips specially distributed uh, across a chip. And to do, we do some sort of normalization to be able to compare the bit flips across different DRAM chips. And uh, here in this plot, you see that a fraction of uh, 64 bit verse containing X bit flips. And on the X axis, you see a number of row hammer bit flips per 64 bit verse. So this is also a histogram, right? And uh, uh, so how you should read this is like, uh, when you look at this uh, bar at one, it shows the population of, uh, or the fraction of 64-bit 60, words containing one bit flip. And uh, this is uh, the population of those uh, words containing two bit flips. And it, it goes down drastically here. And this is a representative plot for DDR3 and DDR4 chips. And when we go to LPDDR4, now we see a different kind of distribution. Now you have a significant population uh, of 64-bit words uh, that experience like two-bit flips or three-bit flips. And uh, this concludes that the distribution of Rohammer bit flips dance to per rows changes significantly in LPDDR4 chips from other DRAM types. And at a bit flip rate of this, um, a 64 bit word can contain up to four bit flips. And even at this uh, very low bit flip rate, uh, a very strong ECC is required to be able to uh, correct all these bit flips. Okay. And, uh, and I have a question. We... Yes. Um, um, in the last meeting, in the last lecture, um, we talked about ECC saying that we can only correct up to one bit flip. So in this case, if there's more than four bit flips, the ECC wouldn't work and well, the system would crash theoretically, right? So uh, there, there are different types of ECCs. So the most common one is called SECTA, single error correction, double error detection. And for that particular ECC type, uh, that is true. And if you want to put an ECC, which is like much stronger and can fix like four bit Phillips, let's say, then you need to sacrifice a lot of your capacity and put some like uh, more complicated uh, error checking and like correction mechanism over there. And it's, uh, it's like co more costly than what the DRAM manufacturers do nowadays. Okay. I don't know okay. if that Thank does you. make sense. Okay. Okay, so we plot this data for uh, different DRAM types and for different manufacturers again. And yeah, you have some subplots that doesn't have some data, but uh, you can see our uh, representative plots for like DDR3, DDR4, and LPDDR4 uh, here. It's it's. These observations are consistent across different DRAM uh, manufacturers and DRAM types. <clears throat> okay, so uh, so far we uh, looked at like how the raw hammer vulnerability changes in terms of the uh, number of bit flips we can induce and uh, uh, the blast radius uh, is the terminology called for this actually, like how wide uh, the uh, effect of raw hammer attack uh, across DRAM roses, and uh, also the like um, distribution within uh, a 64 bit world. Uh, but there's also another important aspect of Rohammer vulnerability um, because uh, the Rohammer defense mechanisms are taking this uh, into consideration a lot. So here the question is, what is the minimum hammer count required to cause bit flips? Uh, and uh, 
this this uh, number is defined as AC first in this paper. Uh, so this is the hammer count to uh, cause the first bit flip, basically. And uh, here you see uh, a plot where on the y-axis you have the hammer count needed for the first bit flip, which is AC first. And on the x-axis, uh, you see different DRAM types. And uh, as we said earlier, like DDR3 old has no bit flips for this range of uh, hammer counts. Um, and uh, in DDR3 new, for example, you can see uh, bit flips when you hammer DRAM rows uh, around like 30K, 40K, around these numbers, right? So uh, maybe I should give more information actually. I think the animation is coming here. Okay. So uh, we, we show a distribution for each uh, DRAM type here uh, uh, with a box and whisker plot and how we need to read this. So this uh, middle line is shown the median uh, AC first across all these DRAM rows, across all these DRAM chips. And um, Q1 and Q3, these like uh, the borders of the box on the bottom and the top uh, are showing the uh, first and third quartiles of the uh, distribution. So it's like uh, the 50% of the population uh, from like 25, first quartile to third quartile, right? The, the middle 50% of the population resides in this uh, area within the box. And also uh, statistically, we expand this uh, uh, distribution and uh, show these whiskers uh, as like the uh, uh, minimum and maximum like mainstream values, I'd say. And there are some outliers uh, below and above uh, these whiskers that we will show with plus signs uh, in, the, in the future plots. Okay, so we note that uh, uh, different DRAM types on the x-axis, DDR3, DDR4, and LP, DDR4, uh, showing like different kinds of AC firsts. And you should consider that uh, low, uh, higher is better in this case, because if you uh, look at like, uh, if, if, you, if you have a chip with, that induces the first bit flip at a higher hammer count, then it means that as an attacker, you need to work more to uh, induce a bit flip, right? So, okay. Uh, we, we, we see a clear decrease from DDR4 old to new and now to LPDDR4 and DDR3 new is also low, right? Uh, okay. So uh, here I'm just showing the same plot for uh, three different manufacturers. So the previous one was from manufacturer C. So this is identical to the previous plot, but uh, you can see like how manufacturer A and B behaves across all these um, different uh, DRAM generations as well. And uh, we conclude that newer chips from a given DRAM manufacturer more, are more vulnerable to throw hammer. And uh, they can induce pit flip, they can experience pit flips at much lower hammer counts. And uh, to put that into numbers in a DRAM type, AC first reduces significantly from all to new chips. So. When you go from DDR3 old to DDR3 new, you go from like 70K to 22K, right? It's, it's like a drastic re reduction actually. And for DDR4, it goes from 17.5K to 10K. So it's already like vulnerable a lot. And in LPDDR4, you can go from 16.8K to 4.8K, which is again, like the quad drop, it, right? It's, it's like very low. And, uh, it is really important that today, uh, actually two years ago, we had chips uh, whose weakest cell failed after only like 4,800 hammers. And this number is really ridiculous compared to what hammer counts you can reach in a like full system kind of attack. So key takeaways from uh, this characterization are, uh, yeah, before going to these key takeaways, uh, do you have any questions about this? Um, does like the operating system have mechanisms to prevent hammer attacks from the uh, computer side? 
So I'm not sure if you have any mitigation mechanism implemented in a, I don't know, like a Ubuntu distribution that you download from internet, but there are academic papers that uh, propose some mitigation mechanisms in operating system level. Um, uh, they, they have some inherent uh, limitations about like uh, detecting precisely a raw hammer attack and reacting uh, quickly enough to, uh, you know, refresh rows before uh, actually a bit flip uh, happens. Uh, so maybe we can look at them uh, like uh, next week, I guess. We have a block hammer presentation. Maybe we can look at and discuss them over there. Um, yeah, yeah, but high level, yeah, there, there are some proposals that don't really work well. And there are some other proposals that implement the defense mechanisms in the memory controller as like, in the hardware level, uh, we will talk about them uh, in a bit. And uh, there are also some uh, defense mechanisms that are implemented inside the DRAM chips in these new ones. And uh, I think Hassan will uh, talk about them in, in some future sessions. OK, thank you. Another question. Um, sure. Thanks for all this insightful information. I wanted to ask, like, so we, we see how roll hammers can occur very frequently in these systems, also newer ones. My question is like, uh, can we estimate how um, impactful roll hammer errors are in general for like uh, large systems? Like can some uh, earnest behavior in larger systems be traced back to uh, these roll hammer pit flips? Like how much does it matter in, uh, in a larger system? Mm. So there are some reliable uh, attacks in the literature that can mm -hmm. like, um, you just launch that attack uh, with some reverse engineering in the, like before launching the attack. And then uh, you can just like induce a bit flip in the page table of an operating system, for example, that gives you the root access. So in that, yeah. in, in that sense, like, uh, I don't know, in theoretical very, point very, of view, it's yeah. like, sorry? Yes, that means it's like a very, it's a very dangerous uh, blind spot that needs to be closed. Uh, yeah. yeah. Have there so actually, been no hammer attacks in the past? Uh, yeah, so what, what, what do you mean? <laughs> like, were there like these, raw, were there like, uh, uh, I mean, malicious raw hammer attacks that people used to gain like access to certain systems in the past? Yeah, so we, we don't know that, right? Yeah. Uh, they, I mean, nobody talks about it. <laughs> if, if they, yeah. like, like, you know, uh, did some attack and then uh, gain some information they shared, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think it's a great, uh, I mean, it's not great. Uh, I, I, I don't know any, like, proof of that, but uh, uh, Google has a Project Zero. Uh, which is focusing on these like security vulnerabilities from like different aspects. Right. And Rohammer is one of them. Okay. And uh, yeah. they actually showed that uh, they were able to uh, uh, get the root privileges. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, also, yeah. yeah. So there are some other uh, uh, attacks in the literature as well. So for example, uh, last year in 2021, there's a paper uh, published uh, showing that they induce, uh, they launch a raw hammer attack on a real system that is running uh, a, a deep neural network kind of uh, application. Uh, and uh, they induce bit flips in the uh, weights of that neural network. And they uh, force the bit flips to occur in like very critical locations in those uh, weights and it causes actually the DNN, work, uh, DNN application to conclude with like uh, a wrong classification of the image provided. Uh, so there's this kind of attacks as well. And then there are some other attacks that, you know, try to steal, mm -hmm. actually they, they successfully steal AES private case. Oh, so oh. <laughs> yeah, if, if you get that, you, you have like access to many systems, right? If this, that is a critical user, for example, that has many privileges. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So I guess it's really good to have these uh, investigations because that really provides a solid ground and justification to, to mitigate this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.
Thanks. There's also another question from Clemens. Uh, how far away from 4.8 K hammers are we in normal use? How likely would it be to adjust accidentally cause bit flips by memory access? This is a fantastic question. So this is, uh, this requires a very rigorous uh, characterization of the workloads actually. Um, so uh, I collected some numbers in the past. Uh, in, in my observations, you can, so when you run some like um, benign workloads on your system, you can observe uh, a hammer count of like 300, 400 in like 64 millisecond time window. And if your system is not configured wisely, uh, if you have like a terrible configuration in your like um, uh, memory locate, uh, what's that like mapping your data into places in your DRAM array, um, uh, this number can go up to like 1000 or so. Uh, so this is still like far from 4.8 K. Um, but uh, given this like trends are decreasing, uh, so we don't know. So th this is number from two years ago, right? Maybe today there is a chip that experiences bit flips of like 2000 hammer counts. We don't know that. And uh, it, it's getting closer and closer. And uh, that's definitely an important problem that we need to look at, uh, like uh, exhaustively try a lot of workloads and uh, find the access patterns that actually accidentally, you know, reach to these numbers. So uh, hopefully, um, if you have a good row hammer defense mechanism in the uh, in, in your system, uh, it shouldn't matter if it's a benign uh, workload or a row hammer attack. Uh, so when they reach to this like critical number of hammer counts, then uh, they should be like mitigated somehow. And uh, at the same time, we want to give like very high performance and high bandwidth to a lot of benign workloads, right? <laughs> so it's 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 like a really tight trade-off at some point. And uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I guess, yeah, I, I hope I answered or gave some rough idea about that. I think we have a project about that in PNS Remulator course, if I remember. Hassan can correct me. If I'm wrong. Okay. Okay, if there's no more questions, I'll go with the key takeaways. Um, okay, so uh, to reiterate our three key takeaways from this experimental characterization, uh, we find that chips of newer DRAM technology nodes are more vulnerable to raw hammer. And there are chips today whose weakest cells fail after like only 4,800 hammers. And chips of newer DRAM technology nodes can exhibit raw hammer bit flips in more rows and farther away from the victim row. And uh, with these key observations from the experimental characterization, we look at the literature of the raw hammer mitigation mechanisms and uh, test how they perform with given this uh, trend in the experimental characterization. So to do this evaluation, uh, we run simulations using uh, a cycle level simulator called Remulator uh, with this system configuration. And we look at like eight core workload mixes, <coughs> excuse me, uh, drawn from spec uh, benchmark suite, which is commonly used for uh, evaluating the performance of uh, hardwares uh, in like uh, many academical works and industrial works as well. And uh, we use uh, several metrics to evaluate the mitigation mechanisms. The first one is DRAM bandwidth overhead. Um, and this is the fraction of total system DRAM bandwidth consumption from mitigation mechanism. And the second one is normalized system performance, uh, which is, uh, yeah, we use weighted speed up as a metric for this. So it uh, gives us the uh, change in the throughput of the uh, system's uh, performance overall. So how many instructions basically you can perform at a given time window, for example, something like that. Um, okay. In our evaluation methodology, we look at five state-of-the-art mitigation mechanisms of the time. And uh, in addition to that, there are some recent papers uh, coming up like um, after 2020, uh, uh, we have uh, another uh, mechanism uh, called block hammer, for example, our group from our group. Another uh, 
uh, defense mechanism came up from another group called Grafen. Uh, those are also, uh, uh, I, I would identify them as state of the art as well, but we don't include them here because, uh, I mean, this work was before those, so they didn't exist before. Okay, and in addition to these five mechanisms, we also look at an ideal refresh-based uh, mitigation mechanism. And uh, all these mechanisms, okay, we have more details on the description of the paper, and uh, we can, you can also find the citations to the original publications. And uh, yeah, uh, so we scale each mechanism based on the descriptions uh, provided in their original papers as much as we can. For some of them, we cannot scale, uh, and I will talk about them. Um, okay, and uh, all these mechanisms are basically following the um, uh, high-level methodology of like observing uh, memory accesses and uh, refreshing potential victim rows. Except this increases refresh rate, increases refresh rate just refreshes everything uh, more frequently. Okay. So here in this plot, we look at the normalized system performance on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we have the HC first, which is the number of hammers required to induce the first row hammer. Bit. So, uh, and we will see like how the system performance changes for different mitigation mechanisms as HC first goes lower from left to right. And it goes from like 100,000 here to like 100 here. Okay. So if you just uh, do brute force, increasing your refresh rate, let's say we were refreshing at 64 milliseconds, let's refresh at 32 milliseconds. And if it's not enough, let's refresh at 16 milliseconds, all the rows. Um, now you have like uh, your uh, performance degraded a lot, right? Even before like reaching 10,000 hammer count, uh, you already reached like 80% performance overhead here. And actually, um, you cannot uh, put like, uh, um, e even like mathematically, theoretically, you cannot uh, address an HC first number before 32K, uh, below 32K by increasing the refresh rate because um, refreshing a row has its own latency and you have many rows to refresh and uh, you end up occupying all your memory bandwidth only for refreshes. And even that is not enough at some point. And uh, there is a theoretical limit over there and you cannot go below 32K. Okay, uh, this is another prior work. Uh, this is also from our group actually, uh, PARA. Uh, what PARA does is like it's, it's uh, as your accesses go and activate rows, uh, at every row activation, it just flips a coin uh, and with some low probability, it goes and refreshes the victim row, uh, potential victim row, which is like adjacent to that row that you, your uh, workload already uh, activated. And uh, here we increase the pro that small probability uh, for uh, like given security target uh, as the AC first decreases. And this prob when this probability increases, then it means that when, uh, your, when your workload activates a row, there's a higher probability that you're gonna activate a victim row, right? Uh, and it, 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 it increases the um, uh, memory bandwidth usage and the latency that you dedicate for PARAS operations. And uh, you again see some performance degradation, not as bad as like increased refresh rate, it goes like very low for up to some point and then uh, it starts going down. And we can like, just like separate that as like, okay, in this region, it's like a low overhead. Uh, your performance doesn't go below like 90% of the uh, original performance. And then uh, after some point, it, it goes like a significant uh, diving, right? And it can reach up to like 80% performance loss when, you, when your HC first gets closer to like 100 activations. Okay, so this is another work, ProHit, and MRLOC is also another work. And these two works are uh, designed as like some extensions to PARA, 
but uh, both of them are designed for a draw hammer threshold of like 2000. And uh, unfortunately, in the original papers, we don't know. Uh, it, it is not provided how to scale uh, some like empirically set parameters in these, um, in these uh, mitigation mechanisms. And their mechanism is like not like very intuitive to you know change the parameters accordingly. So uh, unfortunately, we cannot scale them. But uh, in the original papers, they are claimed to be uh, configured for a raw hammer threshold of two k. So down to two k, uh, you can see like okay, these are really uh, working well. And uh, uh, so far. Uh, these three mitigation mechanisms, all of them are like probabilistic approaches. And uh, now we have uh, a new mechanism called TWICE here. Uh, TWICE has, uh, TWICE actually implements a number of counters in the memory controller. And uh, actually it counts the number of activations for a row uh, over a time window. And it uh, dynamically like uh, prunes some counters, reallocates some counters for different rows to keep its uh, area overhead in a reasonable state because it's not. It doesn't make sense to put a counter for like every single row because there are like a lot of rows. Um, so uh, inherently, because of some design limitations, twice can only um, as it is proposed in original paper, it can only scale down to 32K. So it's, it supports AC first values at 32K and above. And within this range, it, it works perfectly. Like there is no performance overhead. And below 32K, it, it loses security guarantees. But uh, here we assume that uh, uh, one can implement twice by magically overcoming all these like inherent problems and scale down. Uh, and with this methodology, uh, it's overhead is showed with a dashed line here. So it, it performs better than para, but unfortunately it doesn't exist. Okay, so you can see these two critical uh, design issues in the full paper, we explain them here actually. Okay, and finally we, uh, evaluate the ideal refresh mechanism. What ideal refresh mechanism does is it, so here in the simulation, uh, we count the activation count uh, for each DRAM row, and we did not perform any refreshes uh, until uh, the, the hammer count of an aggressor row reaches to the row hammer threshold. Right before it reaches row hammer threshold, let's say if it's like 100, um, we uh, let like 99 row activations to go and then we refresh the victim row. So this is the uh, minimum overhead uh, you can reach uh, with a refresh based mechanism. And uh, here we see that ideal mechanism issues refresh. Okay, uh, I already uh, talked about this. We show that we, we see that at this point, uh, while para reaches like 80% performance or have ideal mechanism can get rid of uh, raw hammer by like only 6% performance loss, which is much more reasonable. Um, okay, and we also mark the uh, current situation here. So with DDR3 old, uh, our HC first is around this number, DDR3 new here, and as you can see with DDR4 and on DDR4, we can go down to this level. So we are at the beginning of the fork, right? So, so far, Parade keeps working. But after this point, we don't know if it's going to work. Uh, I mean, it's, it's going to work, but it will come with a lot of performance overhead. Okay. Yeah. So very low normalized system performance. So it's all about, okay. And there's still a lot of uh, room for improvement for to, to reach the ideal mechanisms uh, uh, perf uh, performance, right? Uh, for AC first values like below 2K, 1K. 
and uh, this is there, there's a significant opportunity for future research. If you if you want to get rid of all these overheads and address raw hammer uh, bit fillups in a very neat, you know, low cost way, you're more than welcome. The whole community is expecting for this kind of <laughs> solutions. Uh, okay, uh, so we have some key takeaways from these mitigation mechanisms. So existing raw hammer mitigation mechanisms can prevent raw hammer attacks with reasonable system performance overhead in DRAM chips today. By today, I mean 2020, two years ago. And existing raw hammer mitigation mechanisms do not scale well to DRAM chips uh, that are more vulnerable to raw hammer. And there's a significant opportunity for developing a mechanism that is scalable with low overhead. Okay. Uh, this is the end of the evaluation of raw hammer defense mechanism in this paper. Uh, do you have questions? I have uh, one question. Uh, I think it's an obvious one. Is like, have there already been any efforts since then uh, that look at these scalable uh, low overhead mitigation mechanisms? Yeah. So and, like, uh, the strategy there, like in in, in short. So uh, maybe I can show here, like, um, so uh, in 2021, actually in, <clears throat> in late 2020, after this paper, and there was a paper called Graphen, and Graphen showed that uh, they can actually, uh, uh, they, they can actually go down to like 1K HC first with uh, almost like 0%. Performance overhead, and uh, in early 2021, we also published a paper called Block Hammer. So it's uh, a little bit different than all these mechanisms because these mechanisms are based on like refreshing the victim rows, and Block Hammer is instead of refreshing the victim rows, it uh, throttles or slows down the. Uh, oh, Hassan already put a, uh, put the full name of graphing paper and a link in the chat, so you can take a look at that as well. And for Block Hammer. Um, uh, we, we throttle the aggressor of activation as the workload itself. So it never reaches the uh, specified AC first. We also show that down to 1K, um, it has like very negligible uh, performance overhead, uh, but below 1K, uh, the performance overheads increase still. So um, if you want to go like below 1K, it's still an uh, open problem. And uh, yeah, Hassan also put uh, the full name of Block Hammer paper and the link is coming as well, I guess. And I think we will uh, talk about Block Hammer uh, next week sometime. Or, or the week after in, in the PNS Remulator course. Okay. Are there other questions? I guess no. So uh, there are many more details and analysis in the full paper, uh, Revisit and Rohammer paper. Uh, you can take a look at them. I'm not going to cover them in the slides. Uh, so we look at like single cell Rohammer with the probability, more details on our data pattern dependence study, and analysis of error correction codes in mitigating Rohammer bit flips, and some additional observations on our data and some other methodology details and further discussion on comparing data across different infrastructures and discussion on scaling each mitigation mechanism. Uh, OK, uh, so that was uh, the existing Rohan mitigation mechanisms. And uh, this paper proposes uh, or um, talks or discusses a future direction about future Rohammer solutions going forward. Um, so two promising directions for new raw hammer solutions uh, we can project from 2020. The first one is DRAM system cooperation. So we believe that the DRAM and system should cooperate more to provide a holistic solution uh, that can prevent raw hammer at low cost. Because uh, when you try uh, providing raw hammer defense at the very end, like at the memory controller, you have a uh, very um, precise view of all the memory uh, events happening, but implementing a complicated mechanism over there or a very like comprehensively uh, safe mechanism over there is coming with like a lot of overhead. 
in terms of chip area, in terms of uh, system throughput, performance, fairness, all these things. And uh, there are also solutions that try to um, do this draw hammer defense in the operating system level. And if you just do it in the operating system level, the attackers are really smart and they have ways to like just work around and reliably defeat all those mechanisms. So you actually need uh, as an ultimate solution, a holistic solution that can prevent drop hammer at low cost. It's like some parts in different parts of like hardware, different parts of in software, they all cooperate with each other and they, ha they, they have a good communication. And with exploiting this, you can actually, uh, yeah, in theory, uh, prevent drop hammer at low cost. But such mechanism doesn't exist. So it's also an open resource problem. So you're welcome to work on it. And uh, the second way is the profile guided, uh, which is like a critical profiling of raw hammer susceptible cells in DRAM. Um, uh, and uh, by doing so, uh, you can uh, build a, a powerful substrate and uh, uh, target different raw hammer solutions like for example, you can uh, you can find the most vulnerable DRAM rows or most vulnerable DRAM cells, and you can only like increase the refresh rate for those ones, right? So this is like a very naive way of implementing this. You can go for smarter mechanisms, and uh, this way you can actually uh, reduce the uh, cost of the existing row hammer defense mechanisms or modify them to scale better, basically. <clears throat> and uh, to be to enable this, we need a fast and accurate profiling mechanism. Uh, this is really a key challenge because uh, uh, if you remember our experimental methodology, we try many different configurations and uh, for each configuration of, uh, or for each experiment, uh, we actually run this like multiple times uh, to make like some, to get statistically significant uh, data out of our observations. Okay, and that concludes the talk. Uh, just to you know summarize everything again, uh, in this work we characterize more than 1,500 DRAM chips from different DRAM type signals and manufacturers. And we studied five state-of-the-art raw hemometrication mechanisms and an ideal refresh based mechanism. And we made two key observations. Uh, raw hammer is getting much worse. It takes much fewer hammers to induce raw hammer bit flips in newer chips and their impact is also larger. And existing mitigation mechanisms do not scale to DRAM chips that are more vulnerable to raw hammer. And uh, you can see performance loss of like up to 80% uh, in the mitigation mechanisms at that time at uh, hammer count uh, uh, as low as like 128, for example. And I think this observation still holds with the new mechanisms. And we conclude that it's critical to do more research on raw hammer and develop scalable mitigation mechanisms to prevent raw hammer in future systems. And that really concludes the talk. Uh, yeah. I'm happy to answer your questions. <laughs> if there's any. Hey, thanks Jerry, for the great presentation. Um, yeah, thanks I guess, so uh, yeah, you learned a lot and uh, thanks for asking questions and uh, participating. Uh, so this was the first part of this meeting uh, and now I will end the live stream and then we will look at the project.